we get the recording. And uh, and it says my internet connection is unstable. Well, fuck. <laughs> Melissa, do you know why the uh, YouTube is not uh, integrated anymore? No, I'm looking through too, and I don't see it either, and I don't know why. I don't know if it's a glitch kind of thing or if something's going on or if they're, I don't know. Well, I'll record it and I can upload it. Anyway, all right, so I've been writing for the past couple of days. Since I've been laid off, I've had a lot of free time, and I've been able to organize my thoughts. And I think I'm kind of, uh, I'm toying with releasing it, but I don't know. I might put a little bit more in it, but I'm going to read a little bit of it tonight because I think it's going to blow your lips off. This is absolutely fantastic stuff. I'm impressed with myself. <laughs> Here's the deal, though. The uh, whole premise of the Grow Galler with me is this, uh, the Groa tells Vitdag all of these things. She calls them charms, and I go through each one of them, and I'm like, wait a minute, this ain't no charm. This is common sense. Right? We get to the last one and she says, the ninth will I chant thee, if needs thou must strive with the warlike giant words, thy heart good store of which shall have and thy mouth of words full wise. Okay? Once again, let's think about it for just a second. Is this really a charm? Or is this a result of breaking an individual down and rebuilding them? It breaks a troop down and then builds him back up. They know the limits of physical performance for an average individual coming into base training, and they will push that limit. And then you get in the rest of the army, and there's, it's a heyday of competition, of continuing to strive to do better. And some people excel, and some people thrive in that environment. And this is what's going on here. And it's going on in a much different way, and there's more going on here than we all might get at the first glance, right? It's of what our parents have taught us is the truth when it is not. The beauty of this story is that she has blown past all of these self-imposed barriers we create for ourselves from our parents' input. How would a father tell his son how much further he could go if he has never gone that far? It's a very difficult thing to do. It's really good to cheer somebody on, but there's something inside of us when we see someone else begin to excel there's the real recognition that, God damn it, I could have done that if I'd have put forth the effort, but I don't, I don't think I want to. I think I'll sit here and watch football or watch the Kardashians or some shit like that. And there's a real thing that happens with everybody. It's human nature. The extreme example of that is Loki when he sees Balder, this perfect individual that nothing will harm. Well, it just infuriates him, you know, so he kills him when he goes to Eager's Feast. The serving man gets a little bit of praise. It pisses Loki off, and so he kills him. We do the same thing with character assassination. I've been told that people will talk about me, and these other guys will say, well, I really don't like that guy. Yeah, right, because I've gone further than some other people have been able to do. It's just human nature. It's not good or bad. It simply is. Groa has helped Svipdag move past all that. She's reminded him of things he's apparently capable of doing. Our ability to grab a hold of these things that, that make us who we are and move past the limits we've been taught, this is the process of becoming a man. One of the real problems with young men about 19, 20, 24 years old is they, they desperately want to make a decision that, that is minus the safety net that their mother provides for them. See, all they've ever had to do is live to get a mother's love. But to get the love of a woman, there's some other things that has to happen. One of the greatest, and every young man wants to believe that the greatest thing, the big enemy he has to fight is something out there somewhere. When it's not, it's in here. And it's as simple as sitting down on the steps and make a decision that takes you outside the comfort zone of what mother and father have provided for you all your life. That's the first step in embracing that. And there's some characteristics that go with that. The first part of the Girl Galder is the outline of what those characteristics look like. Okay? And that's it. That's the first layer that we're looking at. And like every tale in the Eddas, there's many layers to it. Okay? <laughs> One of the most important things we might ever do is to question how a child processes the input 
offered to us by our parents. This is something else we've got to consider. Because when we get right down to it, and this is the framework of how we deal with life. How could we possibly know or understand enough of the child how to process all the input being hurled at us from every direction? This is where the faith of our ancestors steps in to provide us reassurance to take that step. We had no choice but to be shaped by it, driven by it, and sometimes burned out from it. Now here we are seeking a new foundation of life. But to experience a new life, we must become new people, period, with new thoughts and understanding, new experiences, new feelings, and finally, as a new person. We can't simply relabel all that old shit and give it a new name and call it good. There's new things that have to happen. This requires courage. This requires risk. This requires stepping outside of that safety net provided to us by our parents. Our thoughts created our reality, and if we are ever to grasp what that means and also true, it is essential that we begin to do so minus even the most well-intentioned guidance and instructions we might have received, including my own. I've got shortcomings too. I'm gonna to do the best I can. I'm gonna lay some framework. Hopefully somebody can pick these pieces up and take it further than I can. That's the whole point of all of this. <clears throat> See, that, that well-intentioned guidance and instruction we received from our parents, though many of us were not so blessed. Some people were raised in shitholes. Some people were raised by people that were completely absorbed with themselves. And the child was, well, in addition to, or I'll get back to you, or in just a moment, or why don't you stay at mom's house, or go stay at grandma's house. I got some other things I need to do. And we failed to realize we're all they have. There are few newborn mammals in the world that are more defenseless than a newborn human child. And yet we fail to grasp the responsibility of what that means. <clears throat> we must learn new things and enjoy new experiences to raise our heads high and enjoy the benefits of such a grand spiritual horizon laid out in front of us. Any individual who begins to become aware of this magnificent but simple concept will of a necessity have a heart full of wit and a mouth full of words, wise words, because they would have understood and traversed the pain of their ancestors in order to see both sides of this thing we call life. That's a really interesting concept. And I could expound upon it, but there's some other things I want to get here. Now, this is my favorite line out of the whole thing. Stanza 15, it says, Now fare on the where where danger awaits, and let evils not lessen thy love. Wow, what a bold, powerful statement. Let evils not lessen thy love. Give it hell. I mean, that's grabbing it by the nose and whipping its ass. That's what it's all about right there. I have stood at the door of the earth fixed stones, thee while I chanted thee charms. That's Kenos. That's the torch that every ancestor that's passed on holds of their wisdom and their knowledge and everything they've learned. And all the way back to the beginning, every ancestor we had has, have has that torch held up in the air to provide us that guidance, that wisdom, and that instruction. And now they're on the way where danger waits and let evils not let my love. What a powerful statement, a bold statement for an explorer, an adventurer, a man. I love it. I have highlighted this because it is one of the most powerful and beautiful lines in the Eddas. They're on the way where danger awaits, let evils not lessen thy love. That, my friend, is the courage to a mother's wish that her well-trained and disciplined son who stands at the threshold of becoming a true man may face danger in the world, but never, never let it rob you of the ability to love someone. Such a strong role around their heart that it only ends up isolating them further. But this is no way for a man or woman to live. I have beaten my own head against many such a wall to no avail every time it hurt. Every time I lived, I got up and I tried again. And this is what we do in life. We keep getting up. Never, not once have I shied away from loving someone. To me, the option of not daring to do it might result in madness. In order to keep my sanity amidst a world full of people protecting myself, protecting themselves, I made myself the most important thing in my world. And people joke, joke about it. Nobody loves Brian Wilton like Brian Wilton. That's my defense mechanism. That's how I protect myself in the world of madness. I am the priority. <laughs> Perhaps someday we might all find someone who's the most important thing in their world. And the neat thing about that is the willing association of two people who choose to be together. 
Now we're on to something really cool. Minus, minus the cages, everybody, is, everybody else is trying to build around someone so they won't hurt them. To be brave enough to love in a world full of evil is what it takes to stem the tide of ruin attempting to wash over us all. And bear hence, my son, there has said, and let it live in thy breast. Let it live in your breast. Don't just think about it. Let it live in your breast. Let it be a part of every beat of your heart. Thine error shall be the best of fortune. Yeah, big man living a big life, enjoying the best of fortune. Powerful woman, accomplished women that it beats in their heart. You know who they are, and they give freely of themselves to their sisters around them. Thine error shall be the best of fortune, so long as my word shall last. This is akin to every parent telling their child that they can grow up and be president. Right? Why not? The big difference here is that grow has gone over as many important things a man needs to cultivate in his thought process to achieve those things he desires. You can't just say, well, go be president. Well, fucking how? Okay. There's some, there's, you gotta learn. You gotta, you gotta learn new things, have new experiences, have new feelings and become a new person. It's part of the process, right? <laughs> she has given him the instructions as if it were a blessing. She's bamboozled him. She's told him, this is a charm. People will carry a lucky rabbit's foot if they think it'll make them lucky. But she's told him it's a charm, and he's gone off full well believing it. Good for him. But sometimes we got to play a little trick on ourselves, don't we, with our thought process. Indeed, those charms are a blessing, a blessing of common sense and a reminder of the innate power within the man. The real magic is a mother bringing to the surface and empowering all of those fine qualities he was raised with. Qualities we tend to bury when we don't see our friends using them. Give me just a second here. I made a little faux pas in my writing. <laughs> Imagine that. Or when, when we see our friends, they don't use them. Or when we cannot see the value in those old ways. I might set that to the side a little bit. There's this new thing going on. I kind of like it. The old ways we were raised in do not always translate well to the modern world. But this mother knew what to say to her son. She reminded him of the things to which we might all relate. This Fip Dag searched long, long for Mingloth. And those two are not who you think they are. And it led into a great house all about with flames. And before the house, there was a giant. Now there's an interesting concept at work which provides the overarching narrative. Until you know who and what you are, do you ever know what you want to look for? <laughs> How would one ever know what love is if they do not love themselves? If you look through the charms Grow bestows upon Zvigdag and come to grips with the very basic nature of them, one begins to realize that all she has done is worked her magic, but like Dr. Evil, though carefully worded phrases to remind Zvigdag of who he truly is. Groa is creating a clarity of thought which allows Zvigdag to appreciate the faith of Ossetry. Once we begin to grasp this, his journey, like ours, is just beginning. We do not partake in the activity of self-discovery simply to talk about it. We are not looking for another trophy in the cabinet. Gone is the desire for the accolades of individuals who have never ventured forth in life. Now we begin searching. For Sigurd, it was the language of the birds who showed him the true peril he was in. His challenge was to unlearn a great deal of purposely misguided thinking he had been encouraged to embrace, largely composed of half-truths from a coward posing as a wise man. As for Zvitdag, it was Groa who reminded him of what he might truly be capable of. He too had come to grips with some of the nonsense he had begun to believe about himself. Both men come face to face with the ring of fire surrounding the women they will love. It's no different with us. The crucible of flame for the purpose of love will usually burn away the dross of excessive personality and ego to reveal the true nature of a man. And sometimes it might leave him laying in the, <laughs> laying in the dirt. <laughs> the point is, that the journey of self-discovery takes many different forms. The impetus for such an act of courage might originate in the least expected of places, but what the very act of self 
discovery through honesty and embracing adversity usually leads to the development of a new individual who is capable of love. First and foremost, because they have learned to love themselves. How else could it feel to have the spirit of your dead mother reminding you that once again, you have what it takes? And this is an act of love of the highest order. It creates within the breast of any child, no matter how old they might be, that feeling of love and encouragement. So many people are desperately most required about it, but I see it. I'm behind all those masks we present in public, all those bricks in every wall around every heart. There is a being wanting the light it possesses to join with the light of another. And the awesome obligation of every parent is to raise a child of capable of doing just this thing, allowing their light to shine in the presence of darkness, that evil's not less than thy love, and capable of joining it with someone special. That changes the world. All of these charms represent ideas and attitudes necessary for the mortal man. And here's the other part of all of I just said. All of these charms represent ideas and attitudes necessary for the mortal man to reunite with the divine within him. Ingus, the God seed. Ing, being, seeing, doing. There's a reason it's that participle on so many different words of action. Ingus, the God seed, the seed of the divine that's within us. For us to reunite with that also requires a clearing away of the dross that needs to be burned away in a fire, a crucible of endurance and, 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 and just tough ass suffering sometimes. The trouble is there's only one man who is destined to be the love of Mengloth, isn't there? Mengloth means the one with the necklace and that's a kenning for Freya. Freya's mate is Odor. Who's this Viptag cat? A new day whom she searches for since he has been gone on a long journey. This is as much about a tale about the growth of a man and his ability to elevate himself in this mortal frame with his divine nature as it is about a possible reincarnation or misnaming of Ode finally reuniting with Freya. Now there's something to consider, thinking of Ode being on that long journey of discovery. When we begin in to look at this tale in such a light, it is no wonder it's so common in this great spiritual source of inspiration. It is a tale which literally lights the way for a man's growth, but it is also an outline for those who simply wish to live and be happy, as it states in the Riggs Thula. Every teacher or accomplished man has at one point faced the toughest of times, been kicked in the face by life. By, they either grow through it and devolve, or they do not. They either, they either rise above the nonsense being touted as important in this world to become effective as spiritually evolved individuals capable of sharing this knowledge and the love inherent with it, or they wither away and die, having never felt the hand of love upon their chest. Now, this is where he was on a journey. He begins his journey and he says, before the house, he beheld one coming to the home of the giant's high. Svitbad spake, what giant is here? Now, there's some academics, including Sophus Boog, who believe that a stand and lost it. There's some stuff that should have been added that's not there. I mean, this is, this is some old stuff. But what we shall see is this is the beginning of the quantum's got this question and answer scenario, and there's a reason for that. After the customary introductions to, uh, of insult to ward off lesser men, the conversation begins in earnest, and it's no small one. The wise will begin to discover many of the secrets so many people are hungry to learn in that question and answer scenario. Yet the greatest testament to embracing the challenge of life may be found in the fact that Svipdek can answer them all. For the gifts he has been reminded of by his mother, Groa, have also provided him with an immense get up again and you tried and you've had a broken heart and you've been abused and you've been kicked in the teeth and you've lost everything and you're a man or a woman and it's all gone wrong and you get back up one more time. What do you come up with? 
You know, two choices. You can come up with another brick for the wall, or you can come up with the kind of insight that allows you to develop wisdom and compassion and caring for those still dealing with it. As Julian the Apostate would say, what is a God but a being who knows himself so much more intimately than we do? I think that's in the Mispoganon. Fjell, Fjellsvith spake, what seekest thou here for what is thy search? What friendless one fain wouldst thou know? By the way, so wet must thou wander hence. For weakling, no home hast thou here. Svitnag spake, what giant is here in front of the house to the wayfarer? Welcome tonight. Now, Fjolvis means much wise. He begins reminding him that he is indeed alone. Out in the wilderness, as it were, and this one is a fen. A fen is a kind of swampy area where people will collect the peat used in building material or firewood. Gildsvith calls him a weakling right off the bat and asks him just exactly what are you doing out here? Who the hell are you, fella? He stands guard at the door of a special house and Fjolsvith cares not about the customary obligation to offer travelers hospitality. His duty is far more important to him. He's been at it a long time. Fjolsvith spake, greeting full fair, thou shalt never find. So hence shalt thou get thee home. Fjolvis am I, and wise am I found, but miserly am I with meat. Thou shalt never enter within the house, and go forth like a wolf on thy way. To top off the unkind and insulting greeting, it is coupled with a reminder that this fitbag is not welcome here at all. Don't know who you are, go on. There is no hospitality to enjoy in this home. Philbeth takes care against the idea that he may end up in a confrontation of questions and answers with Odin by reminding him that his name, very name means much wise. Sometimes the travelers posing as Odin had to be put in their place lest they lose their heads posing as the All Father. That was one of the reasons we had hospitality. That's why it's so important. Somebody shows up on your doorstep, if you've got to be a confident, capable individual, to secure a home and create an environment where your wife and children might thrive, you got to be able to protect that too. So if somebody shows up on your doorstep, and hopefully they're not a berserker, uh, they could be posing as Odin. You just never knew if who you were entertaining might not be the real deal. And there were travelers that, that did that. They went around, they were wise people, they shared knowledge, they told stories, they sung songs. None of that nonsense is going on here. They're outside the boundaries of the customary obligations of culture. They're in the wilds of nature in this environment. <coughs> Spitdag spake, a little bride of the gates of the Golden Hall, and a home shall I here enjoy. So he's already talking shit. And he starts with honesty. It's always the best policy. He knows here's where he's supposed to be, but sometimes a frontal assault may not be the best option. How many of us have beat our head against the wall of someone's heart only to find that the moment we changed some aspect of how we related to them, did, change, did things change for the better? I want you to pay close attention to that. We did something different, not them. Gilvis spake, tell me now, fellow, what father thou hast and the kindred from who, of whom thou camest. Spitdag says, being cold I am I, and far cold son, and feel called his father was. Now this is the art of war. He is confronted with what appears to be a superior force. First he bluffs to determine exactly how strong this being is. Spitdag tries to convince Fjolvith that he is called means the cold of early spring, and fuel cold means much cold. Now, one of the arms that Groa reminds Zvipdag of is that she said he would never freeze to death among the cold crags on the mountain. Perhaps this has given him in some insight into the base fear of most men who have been in the cold experience. It is miserable. There's no condition like it, I promise you, to be so cold that you begin to lose feeling in your toes and even a small strike to your finger will cause immense pain. The skin on your face stings, and as if it, I mean, it feels like it's burning. And all the while, the sun is shining like a great big lie, you know, that it just often this hope of a lie that you'll ever be warm again. Things begin to break as they lose the flexibility of the moisture within them, and all the water is frozen, I promise you. Um, thirst is a constant companion. 
having trained in the infantry at negative 62 degrees below zero in Alaska, I promise you, I can tell you it is the most miserable experience you'll ever have. I mean, fuck, even bears hibernate during that shit. You know what I mean? And they're, I mean, that's not something I'm going to fool with. But this is also the cold grip of fear. And there are a few things which will paralyze a man into an action such as fear. It will cause him to hesitate, even if for a moment. And this is all Svitbag needs to see, the hesitation before he plants his strike. And Svitbag is attempting to bluff the old fifth, goddamn name, much wise into believing he is a truly physically formidable opponent, probing for a weakness as he creates the stalemate where the question and answer scenario might begin in earnest. Now answer me much wise the question I ask. For the truth, what I know, who is it that holds and has for his own the rule of this hall so rich, right? Because he can see it over his shoulder. He can see what's back there. And it's impressing the hell out of him. <laughs> the old spake, Mingloth is she. Her mother bore her to the son of Svartharin. And yes, I'm butchering those names and no, I don't care. She is it that holds and has for her own the rule of the hall so rich. Now, there are many halls in this world and the others, but there's one type where fools rush in where angels fear to tread. And I had to use that because I don't know who said it, but it's so good. And those are the halls of a woman's heart. And every time a man chances to glimpse into those halls, they appear as rich and luxurious as anything man has ever created. And they are indeed rich and full and fair full of delicate things and fire. <laughs> Don't doubt it. For an accomplished woman, one who is secure in who she is, there will ever only be one ruler of such a place, be it her or someone she chooses. And she is it that holds and has for her own the rule of that hall so rich. But Svipdag is aware of who he is. Girl encouraged him to fare on the way where danger awaits and let evil not lessen thy love. And now we begin to see the wisdom of this statement. For the only way a confident man might ever establish a place where a woman is free to express this beauty is to do so with the inspiration of one who is, and that takes courage, because quite frankly, when she begins to express that, it's going to be completely outside the realm of anything pink and purple and soft and comfortable and warm and burn your ass and cold and it ain't gonna be anything he can control. Well, that's a terrifying thing to put all the faith right here into that and you ain't got no control over it. That takes courage. That's what it is. That's why you have to love yourself first. That's why you have to believe in yourself first. A confident man can handle a, an accomplished woman, a competent woman who expresses that of herself. It's a real challenge, but it's a real pattern of growth and it's right here in our Lord. Spipdag spake, now answer me for the old bit, the question I ask, for now the tr truth would I know. What call they the gate for among the gods, ne'er a man so grim a sight. So he's looking at the gate to the house, and it ain't no joke. Muchwise says, Thrymgyal they call it, was made by the three, the sons of Soblendi, and fast as a fetter the fairy it holds, whoever shall lift the latch. Now this terrifying gate made by the dwarves means loud clanging. <laughs> and there are few doors in the would clang so loudly and solidly shut as one a woman and matter here, right? It shuts rapidly upon those who attempt it. And there, but there is one other door that quickly slams shut upon people. And that is the doorway of death itself. So yeah, that will get you. If you ain't got what it takes to hold it open or put a foot in the door, or you say the wrong thing, it will slam shut. And it will slam shut on your head if you're not paying attention. Spitbag spake, now answer me if you'll much wise the question I ask, for now the truth would I know. What call they the house for no man beheld amongst the gods so grim a sight? Now we're looking at something that's kind of scary. The house itself is scary. Gastropner it is, of old I made it. So he made it. He's been there since the beginning. From the limbs of Lieberbeamer, I braced so strongly that fast it shall stand. 
so long as the world shall last. So he's built something enduring. Truly an awe-inspiring house. Gastropner means a guest. <laughs> Many guests may attempt to enter the house of love with a young woman. Their words are not fair, nor are their actions. Women will do the same to men. The house of one's destined love is not something to play around in. It will crush you. For decades, the music industry has thrived upon songs of the brokenhearted. We've all fell victim to it. Dilly dallying around in some place we shouldn't have been fucking around in. Boom, the door slams shut and you get your ass crushed. Whoa, man. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, music, country music is all about it. Now, the house of love itself is an ancient place built by much wise from the limbs of Emir himself. Le Leerbremer means clay giant, a poetic twist of words describing the making of the earth from Emir's flesh. And perhaps it is something we all feel when we come across the right person. It feels safe, secure, strong, built to last the ages, able to withstand the storm, protected by loyalty. It's only today that we're free enough to begin to explore this horizon of personal growth, minus the requirement of survival. Okay, maybe this is why it's so hard to do. This beautiful and alien environment, which has heretofore only been the playground of the gods, yet we would all willingly suffer the damage of a gate closing upon us to taste even a bit of what it means. We see the scars upon the faces of those about us, the scars of those who have tried and failed, but occasionally we see those, we see in the smiles and in the eyes, a flash of light from those who have succeeded. It's enough to keep us trying, ain't it? Even if it is only half-heartedly. What we must not shy away from or pursue only half-heartedly is our own growth. The gate which all too often closes upon us is the realization that we have created a scenario whereby someone else validates the quality of who we are. And that's always a recipe for failure. Such can never be the case. It is only after we have created for ourselves such a place that serves as an eternal reminder of how we that we will be able to open such doors without the fear of it slamming shut on us. One thing I always tell people who are struggling with this, okay? Imagine the perfect partner and then picture them in your mind, every every aspect of them. Now actively imagine how they would treat you. Now treat yourself like that, day in and day out. That's how you learn how to love yourself. That's where you'll figure out those little hangups that are getting in the way of enjoying a strong personal connection with someone dear to you. It might only ever be as a friend. It might be something more, it, but it might help you raise a child, a beautiful child in this world. And you can't go wrong with that. So, expect now answer me much wise the question I ask for now the truth what I know what call they the tree that cast abroad its limbs o'er every land Mimimith its name and no man knows what root runs beneath it fire nor iron shall fell it Ingersoll doesn't fall at Ragnarok doesn't burn down nothing chops it down it, sh it groans but it don't go down the tree it bends in the storm it doesn't break it's a giant's term for Yggdrasil, the tree whose limbs spread out over all the worlds. There are, only, there are other places in the lore which suggest that there are many who know what lies at the base of the tree, where the three great roots run, and what wells lay at the base of each. And to insinuate that no man would know is a dig at Svitdag and his lack of knowledge. There's still a contest of wits going on here. Okay? Spitbag spoke, now answer me much wise the question I ask for the truth would I know. What grows from the seed of the tree so great that fire nor iron shall fell? And this ain't, this seed of Yggdrasil is nowhere else discussed. Much wise spake, women sick with child shall seek its fruit to the flames to bear. Then out shall come what within was hid, and so it is mighty with men. Yeah, I struggled with that one. 
The fruit of Yggdrasil is nowhere else mentioned. The simplest explanation for this stanza is that it is a fruit which eases the pain of childbirth for women. And this could be many things. It could be the ancestral knowledge women pass down one to another to handle the experience. It may be a mixture of herbs and charms of their own which aid the young mother to be. I wonder though if the last two lines have anything to do with the first two. Then out shall come what was hidden within and so it is mighty with men. And perhaps they do. For there are few things which bring about so abrupt a change in a man's personality as the birth of a child. It forces to the top a new kind of love and a newfound willingness to achieve the impossible for someone other than yourself. And men keep this hidden. This unfamiliar attribute that is so powerful, mighty indeed is the man who is proud of his beautiful daughter. He will do great things for her. I promise you. Proud is the father who his sons achieve greatness in their own right. You bet your ass I am. It is the next step in the evolution of both men and women, this fruit of Yggdrasil, a completion of a cycle of death as the gallows for Odin and the seed of life for man and woman. The final culmination of this example of the seed of Yggdrasil is the emergence of leaf and leaf for share, life and the love of life after Ragnarok from the trunk of this magnificent tree. Each seed of Yggdrasil is the life of a child, a birth, a seed which forces men and women to climb a little higher on the rungs of the ladder of their own personal growth. Ooh, I like that. Spit back. Now answer me, much wise, the question I ask, for now the truth would I know. What cock is he on the highest bough that glitters all with gold? To me. <laughs> much wise spake. They throff near his name, and now he shines like lightning on Mimieth's limbs. And great is the trouble which, with which he grieves, both the certains and mora. The throff near means tree snake. I don't know, maybe it's like a dinosaur, you know, feathered dinosaur. It's a big giant, you know, hell who knows? It could be a raptor for all we fucking know. And he is the one who rouses the fire giant Surtur and his wife Sinmora to the final battle. Identical in nature to Fialar, who is also named as rousing the giants to the final battle. Gollum can be rouses the gods to the final conflict. And, some, and we get into it later on. Sinmora possesses the only weapon, weapon capable of killing this cock. Now, I don't know if you ever lived on a farm or been anywhere near a place where two roosters spent the morning hours answering each other, but it is annoying enough to make you get out of bed, I promise. So, so it is here. Two great roosters calling out their plaintive cry to arms for the gods and the giants. And so it is with every one of us to get up and give it all we've got each day. We got to answer one or the other. Struggling with the good and bad inside each of us, making decisions which allow us to ascend a little higher this trunk of Yggdrasil or towards higher planes of understanding and existence or not. Maybe to regress a little bit. Maybe we embrace something different. We might decide to listen to those old tapes and follow our old ways until it burns us enough to want to stop and try again. It's the nature of life. Today, though, for many of us, we have a choice which has not always been present. Spit bag spake. Now answer me much why the question I ask. For now the truth would I know. What call they the hounds before the house? So fierce and angry they are. Much why I spake. Gif call they one and Gary the other. If now the truth would thou know, great they are, and their might will grow, till the gods to death are doomed. This is a probing of the defenses continues. Svipdag inquires as to the name of the two hounds which stand guard at the door, both of which names mean greedy. And hungry they are, these hounds which will devour, devour a lesser man attempting to fool with a woman's heart. Mm, trust me. The same reason women have been told to cover up and not be seen by religion. Uninspired, uninitiated, and untested men have done their best to eradicate this weakness. Instead of accepting the challenge to become better men, they have decided to rely upon something outside of themselves to determine the quality of who they are. It's a glaring weakness to these hounds, and they will devour any man who is waiting on anything else to convince the lady of the house that he's worthy. So any dude that's standing there saying, go ahead and tell her I'm cool. Go ahead and tell her I'm cool. They're going to eat his ass up. 
It's just the way it is. But deeds, not words. Those deeds reside squarely in the realm of building oneself into a being capable of negotiating this obstacle. Okay, I'll stop right there. And, uh, but it gets better, I promise. But it's almost nine o'clock. And um, I know some of y'all got to get up in the morning and uh, grab life by the balls and whip its ass or anything they want to talk about or anything that I said tonight. But, what uh, you like said I about. Say, I, I've got. What? Well, what you said about uh, common sense. Um, it may be the you know, the modernness of it all, but um, I find that common sense isn't very common. Um, it's not. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, you know, the whole, uh, uh, I think that modern medicine killed, you know, the uh, whole survival of the fittest thing because the people that would have done stupid things and died are now reproducing. Well, ain't that the damn truth? <laughs> you see them marching yeah. in the street calling themselves Antifa. <laughs> yeah, they're the ones that are uninspired, uninitiated, untested. They told them they could be president, but they didn't tell them how. And so now they're pissed. They're throwing a fit. Golly, I can't see shit. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of wisdom hidden in this tale. I'll probably go through it a couple more times before I release it, but uh, it gets into, it goes on past, you know, the question and answer, and, you know, he thinks he's winning, but much why it was leading him in a circle, an impossible task. You know, what, what he asked him, what can I do to sneak past the dogs? And he says, well, it needs a wing joint from that gigantic rooster sitting in the tree. Well, I don't know why. I don't know why these dogs would need a couple of buffalo wings. He says, "Okay, how'd I go get it?" He said, "Well, there's a sword in a box uh, that Sinmora owns that you can sneak over there, but it's covered in runes. It's got nine locks on it. Loki put the runes there." Okay, how do I get Sinmora to do it? Well, you got to get a tail feather from that bird. So he's talking to him in a circle. I mean, it's a real interesting dialogue there, but there's a lot of wisdom found in it. But it gets to the actual hill of healing. The, the name of this, where this building lives, is the hill of healing. And there's a lot of talk about men in this, because this is what I'm familiar with. There's something real beautiful. I, I, you know what, I am going to say this, because I don't want to leave it out. It's real important, because, because women have a real important role in all this. And I'm talking about some things, but Svitbag asked, not answer me much why the question I asked, what are the maidens are they that at Mingloth's knees are sitting so gladly? So the name of the place she lives is called the Hill of Healing. So this goddess of love, Mingloth is Freya. And there's, she, that's a kenning for Freya. She is the one that has the Brisingam in gym. She sits on this Hill of Healing surrounded by fire, but she's got these maidens that sit at her knees. Much why I've answered, Hleif is, is one name, Hleif Thrasa another, South Vara call they the third, Bjorten, Bleak, Bleeth, and Freeth, Ayr, and Arbotha. Some, that's, the names are very important that she loves. Spitback had to go off and grow up and become an odor, had to grow off and become a man. Maybe he died and was reincarnated and had his spit back. I don't know. But he is the one destined to be Freya's love. No uh, Okay. He goes off on this journey. He has to go as a man and embrace the call to action, to suffer, to endure anguish, to deal with real physical pain, to figure out who the hell he is and what he's capable of. For the woman, she's got a broken heart. She misses him. What she does is she creates this, she takes up residence in this hill of healing, which is a very special thing. But it says that it is a, it's these made who sit upon the hilltop have names which offer every woman hope. So it says she lives on the hill of healing and it is a joy to every woman who climbs this mountain. So while the man is out doing his thing, this woman, these women also have this mountain to climb, this hill of healing. They've got to ascend to something as well. They've got some things 
they've got to. And the whole time it says she's laying there sick herself, still dealing with it. She has a broken heart and she never stops helping her sisters. Leaf is the helper. Leaf Throtha is the help breather. They can get some help. They can begin to breathe again. Theofvara is the folk guardian. And of course, you're going to love that. Bjot is shining. Bleak is white. Blythe is bleeth. Frith is peaceful. And finally, Air, who Snorri himself equates with the Greek and Roman Hygieia, this goddess of healing, are both and means the gold giver. So these women that ascend, they begin to get the help, and they find a place where they can safely breathe, and their needs are taken care of, and healing can begin in this house of love. So for the man that has the courage to love, he finds the woman that has, the, has been healed by love. These are some very powerful, important, and very deep concepts. And they're so vitally important to the success of everything. And it would be the work of a folk guardian for our people to find this amongst each other. And that goes on. And this is indeed a place where a woman might ascend to find all the support she might ever need. She could find herself here and even become what she was meant to become all along. A safe place where a woman might breathe freely and be protected. A place of like-minded woman shining with the inner joy of healing and sisterhood. So long denied one another in this world. A joyous place for a woman to be. A place where a man might lose a woman forever, right? If he thinks he loves, if he doesn't do something about himself. So there's a real deep stuff going on here. And I think this is one of the most important lay I think I've ever worked with. Um, but they also say, soon aid they all who offerings give on the holy altars high. So these women are all making, you know, if you're making offerings to him, and if danger they see for the sons of men, then each from ill do they guard. So they're giving of themselves still, as a woman, as a mother does. Understanding and wisdom here, in the same fashion that Groa imparted upon Zvipdag, those reassurances whereby he might make himself worthy of the woman he loves. These maidens offer the same kind of protection and support for men who are willing to try, willing to make offerings and do the work. They will guard them from harm. And sometimes for a man, that's all he needs, baby, that a woman he loves believes in him. He could stack BBs for a fucking hour at a time if he felt such a thing in his own heart. <laughs> so what we must recognize is that there is as much effort to be done, but this is the natural order of things. You know, if you leave... home and you go to work and your house ain't worth a shit such endeavors, endeavors or if you prefer those who do fall in love and move forward together as they make offerings and invite the divine into their homes their future will indeed be a bright one see the rigs thula so it begins to tie together there as well they get to live and be happy as it says in the rigs thula when they invite the divine into their home there's a it all really begins to tie together, but that I get real passionate about it because I, I think it's I think it's beautiful. I think there's hope there. I think there's healing there. I think there's strength in all of it. And uh, it's like every damn book I write. But, you know, the latest one I write is the greatest fucking thing ever. <laughs> but that's just me. <laughs> but it's um. But there's a lot of stuff that goes on here. But this this Fipdag odor Mingloth Rhea, when they finally get to be together, they have endured a lot. And they've become what they're supposed to become to be together and enjoy each other, not in a cage, but in a willing association of two very competent, powerful individuals in their own right. And that's what we've been led away from for so long. When we look at monotheism, we begin to understand that the probationary status of, you know, the best part of who we are resides out there with somebody else's permission somehow. Well, that robs us of our ability to be important to ourselves, to stand alongside someone else who is just as important to themselves and share a willing association. And there's a lot of power in that. There's unbreakable bonds in that. There's a strength to ensure that the folk guardian has plenty of work there. There's so much going on in this tale, it's not even funny. And this is probably going to be one of my favorite books.
anyway, I'm sorry, I got excited a little bit. I didn't want to leave that part for the women out because I think that's a beautiful thing. I think that's something that's so often important for, for women to be sick, uh, even when they're hurting. And I don't see that very often. <sighs> Usually some dude's fault, but whatever. And he's got to grow too. He's got to figure it out. That door will slam shut on him in a heartbeat. He's got to figure out his own pain, doesn't he? So when we begin to take responsibility for that, when we begin to become accountable for that kind of stuff, that's when the real magic of this spirituality happens. Now we really do have a new thought. Now we really do have a new experience. Now we really are becoming a new person. And if there's anything that's ever going to justify our seat at the table of the world's great religions and spiritualities, it's going to have to be something along those lines. I simply can't go up there because I, if I just go up there and say, well, because I'm white, I'll have as much effectiveness as Black Lives Matter. But if I go up there with something like that, now I can stand with my head held high and my chest stuck out as an accomplished individual with something worth recognizing something that might garner the attention of the other 850 million Caucasians that have every bit of right to worship this spirituality. And if others want to find it, find it, have it, go have it, enjoy it. Because this kind of stuff isn't being taught in the world's religions. The freedom of man and women to enjoy a willing association with each other, my gosh, it's a terrifying thing. It requires courage to love. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. All right, guys. I think I've yammered enough. I'm just excited about it. I got it done earlier today, and I'm toying with the idea of publishing it. And I, uh, I might just, I have some other parts of the lore I want to add to it, but I think I'm just going to let this stand alone as it is. I may go through and put some more into it, but it's just not very long. It's just 87 pages and 15,000 words. I really want it to be about 60,000, but we'll see. We'll see. I might get some inspiration somewhere. Never can. I might have a dream. Who knows? Shit. <laughs> Any questions? All right, guys. Tomorrow's Monday. Go out there and grab life by the nose and whip its ass. Don't let them get you down. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thanks everybody for joining me. I'm real sorry about the technical difficulties. I, that was just out of my control tonight. Have a good night, guys. Thanks, Brian. You too. Thank you.